good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Churchill. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, should I say good morning to you? Thank you very yes. much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, let me briefly introduce our speaker. Uh, Craig Churchill uh, has more than 20, uh, two decades of microfinance experiences in both developed and developing countries. He is now the chief of social finance program and the team leader of impact insurance facility at the International Labour Organization. And he's also the founding chair of uh, Microinsurance Network. Uh, and uh, last year at COP28, uh, ILO and the UNEP, the UNEP Finance uh, Initiative jointly launched a Just Transition Finance Report uh, that talks about pathway for banking and insurance. Uh, here in Taiwan, uh, we have a uh, Climate Change Response Act. Uh, in the Act uh, 2050, net zero is the legal obligation of the government that is uh, incorporated in the Climate Change Response Act. And in order to achieve a 2050 net zero, uh, our executive Yuan have also adopted the 12 key strategies to achieve 2050 net zero. And two of the strategies are respectively green finance and just transition. Uh, for green finance, the previous and probably the current focus of Taiwan's financial sector uh, relates to the development of low carbon and renewable energy. Uh, for just transition uh, and its relationship with uh, green finance is an emergent uh, issue in Taiwan. So today uh, we are very honored to have uh, Craig Churchill to talk about uh, this important uh, report and introduces the concept of uh, just finance, uh, just transition finance uh, for the banking and insurance sector. So uh, Craig, you have the floor, please. Great. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I guess it's afternoon there. Uh, yeah, as um, the moderator said, my name is Craig Churchill. I head up the social finance program at the International Labor Organization in Geneva. So I'm in Geneva, Switzerland at the moment. Um, and the ILO uh, is a bipartite organization bringing together uh, workers, employers, and governments to deal with issues related to the world of work. Uh, in general, the ILO ends up uh, setting standards uh, for issues related to the world of work, things like child labor or occupational safety and health, or um, uh, right now a big agenda for the ILO is, is promoting a living wage um, as opposed to um, just focusing on minimum wages. So those types of issues are sort of bread and butter issues for the National Labor Organization. One that um, has certainly gotten the attention uh, in, since uh, the Paris Agreement is uh, this issue of uh, transition, uh, transition away from uh, carbon emitting industries and, uh, and toward green uh, energy sources uh, and energy, uh, green businesses. Um, and you know, obviously, the focus on this agenda is, has been naturally coming from the environmental perspective. Uh, and with all of the, the worsening conditions we're seeing around the world in terms of uh, floods and disasters um, and other disasters, it, it's quite imperative that um, more progress is, is made in making this transition. But from the ILO perspective, one of the key things that um, we're trying to promote, and I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to be with you today to, to promote it, is the fact that we can't just make this transition uh, on its own without taking into consideration the impact that it's having on, on the workers and on the communities uh, that are being affected. Uh, and so that's sort of the main thrust behind uh, what I want to cover today. Um, as the moderator said, I head up the ILO social finance program, uh, where we look at how the financial sector can contribute to the ILO's agenda. Uh, and the ILO's agenda is um, trying to promote decent work, promote social justice, uh, and um, 
We do that by looking at different segments of the financial sector and seeing how they can uh, make that contribution. So now I'm talking my, about my particular part of the ILO, not the ILO as a whole, but the social finance program within the International Labor Organization. And social finance, we look at banks and, and microfinance institutions to see how they can create social justice in the financial markets by um, serving underserved market segments, low-income households, microenterprises, and so forth. We also look at the insurance industry to see how they can um, be a partner uh, to governments in achieving public policy objectives, uh, and uh, as well as serving underserved market segments. So we call that impact insurance. And then we look at sustainable investing and to see how investors can um, consider the impact that they're having on the world of work. Uh, what sort of jobs are they creating and how can they use their uh, investments to, to stimulate um, not just job creation, but improving working conditions as well. So it's in this context um, with a particular focus on the, the sustainable investing side that we have gotten quite actively involved in this idea of, of just transition. Uh, and recognizing that um, financial institutions, um, banks and investors uh, and insurers all have important roles to play in trying to facilitate the transition in general and to make sure that that transition is as just as possible. What I'm showing you here is um, three important ways of thinking about this. Um, the, the moderator talked about priorities for Taiwan uh, and uh, green finance as being one of the priorities. And I'd say that's in this first column here, the green and low carbon activities and wanting to see investments in green and low carbon activities um, in order to uh, re yeah, replace energy sources, um, replace carbon emitting energy sources in particular. But there's also other um, business features that um, have green elements, whether it's, it's housing or certainly the transportation sector and so forth. The, the second category is the high emitting, hard to abate activities. And here what we're looking for is how to move away from um, the traditional sources or historic sources of, of energy um, and the businesses that, the, um, the industries that are in particularly high carbon um, emitting industries. Uh, construction is one certainly, production of steel and, and cement, for example, but uh, and the transportation and energy sectors are, are also quite, uh, quite challenging. Um, so the first, cat, first column is the opportunities, the green um, businesses that could be invested in. The second one is moving away from the carbon emitting. And then the third column there, adaptation resilience building, is also recognizing that we have already been affected quite significantly um, by climate change. And some of that is, is bound to be unreversible. Uh, and as a result, we need to really be thinking about how to invest in resilience. Um, and here, um, it's certainly risk prevention activities, but also insurance fits into this discussion um, and how insurance can um, contribute to enhanced resilience. So that was all the so finance um, of the transition, transition financing, those three elements. And now what I'm adding with these, um, what would you say those are, hexagons, or they look like um, beehive maybe, uh, the, the just elements that need to be thought through when we think about all three of these columns. Um, so labor rights, indigenous people's rights is something that we need to sort of have in our considerations when we're um, making this transition in all three columns. Uh, social and employment um, benefits. And, and here, uh, it's really thinking about the, the skills uh, and the links to, to other businesses that are there. Then the third is the upskilling and reskilling. Um, you know, the, the numbers are quite 
impressive uh, that there'll be uh, over the next five years, probably 100, 100 million uh, new jobs that will be created in, in green industries. Um, but so that's that first column, 100 million uh, green jobs created in those uh, sectors. But there'll be 70, 80,000 jobs lost in, in the second column in terms of the transition away from the high emitting, uh, hard to abate activities. Um, and unfortunately, those jobs that are lost in that second column won't naturally be um, easily replaced by the jobs created in that first column. Uh, because of skills, the, the workers in those, um, say, mines or um, oil rigs and so forth, um, they wouldn't necessarily have the skills to be making solar panels, for example. Um, and so, so that's one dimension. The other dimension is the geography, that where the green jobs are being created is not necessarily in the same communities with the jobs that are being lost by the transition effect. Um, so big um, consideration in terms of um, the upskilling and reskilling of workers who are likely to lose their jobs as we make this transition. Same thing goes for the communities where those workers are, are um, working. Uh, many of them are dependent on um, you know, the, the employment from you know, large employers, particularly you know, in the mining sectors where this is most obvious, um, where the communities are, are really dependent on the mine. You close the mine down, what happens to the community? Um, but it's the same with other, um, other industries as well, where there's large employers that uh, the communities are dependent on. Uh, also, the next um, sort of hexagon there is, is land and indigenous people's rights, um, wanting to make sure that as we're thinking about putting out solar farms or wind farms, um, that, um, that we're taking into consideration uh, the, the rights of, of people who may have access to those or the, the, um, the conditions in which they, they're owned. And then lastly, protecting against uh, livelihood and household risks is also a factor. And they're thinking in particular about the adaptation of resilience. So this is just a, a way for thinking about, about the transition, the three dimensions that are, are needed um, for us to be considering. Uh, and then the um, six elements that we want to, to apply as we're making this transition, both into the green opportunities, as well as away from carbon emitting industries, and as well as um, protecting against risks in the future. So as the moderator mentioned, the ILO came out um, with uh, uh, the study uh, last year together with UNEPFI um, that really synthesizes a lot of the experience to date uh, within the financial sector to highlight some of the um, lessons uh, learned and opportunities that are there um, for them to be able to, to operate more effectively. Uh, and uh, so this provides a, a link to the, the research and it builds on some other work that has been done um, by others, including GFANS, um, which is the, the Net Zero Alliance. So to, to develop this publication, we, um, interviewed and, and uh, engaged with a whole host of different financial institutions, banks and insurers to understand some of their experiences and their approaches. Um, and we also had a, an advisory group of other organizations that were working on this um, to help us sort of um, interpret some of the lessons and experiences that uh, we were hearing. Um, in terms of what a, a just transition is, uh, so I've explained it a little bit already, but it's also sort of thinking about um, not just the, the mitigation piece, um, but thinking about the adaptation elements as well. So we, we need to, to be working on these both uh, in hand in hand and considering not just the risks that are out there in terms of um, the climate risks and worsening conditions, um, but also the opportunities. Uh, so it's really bringing these four elements together in a, in a holistic way um, 
and it's really thinking about how financial institutions, banks, and insurers um, can take advantage of the opportunities while mitigating the potential risks that they're exposed to. We've considered um, four different dimensions uh, of the transition that are necessary to make it just. One is thinking about the effect that it has on specific target groups um, and, and stakeholders. Um, an, another is uh, the sector that uh, are being impacted and each sector is have different implications. Um, so we've talked about you know, construction sector, energy sector, um, transportation sectors, they're all gonna be affected differently and, and require different interventions um, that, that are needed. Uh, and then the third one is really thinking about place-based considerations. And this is the point that I was making earlier that um, communities that are dependent on large employers that are affected by this transition are gonna not just affect um, the businesses and the workers in those businesses, but all of the surrounding um, sort of suppliers and you know, the people providing lunches to the people working there and so forth. So that there's a, a big ripple effect that uh, happens geographically. Uh, and then we also need to think very specifically about the um, populations that might be exposed uh, and how they might be exposed differently, thinking about women, uh, youth, uh, indigenous populations and so forth. Uh, so I think one of the, the challenges in engaging with the financial sector and, and asking the financial sector to take on the burden of uh, engaging and promoting a just transition is um, for them to say, what's in it for, for me? Why should I be engaged in this? I being a bank or an insurance company, why is this important for me? And I think there's sort of, sort of a carrot and stick angle there. The sticks being, um, you know, what regulations governments might be creating and encouraging or requiring rather um, financial institutions to be able to, to follow certain, um, achieve certain indicators or, or um, report on certain uh, activities. Um, but then there's also related to that um, sort of the, the upside. Uh, so there's reputational damage that might be there if they're seen to be investing heavily in carbon emitting industries, for example. Um, but there's also the upside of being you know, good corporate citizens and how that might attract additional uh, investment into their businesses or um, increase their, their customer base, for example. Uh, and I think one of the tricky parts here is, you know, should banks or insurers be first movers? Should they, is there an advantage to getting out ahead of their peers and being seen in a positive way? Or um, can, does that extra, is there extra costs associated with that? Is that justified? Um, and this is, I think, one of the, the tricky pieces because I think what we're, where we are right now in the sort of life cycle of this discussion is much more focused on the voluntary you know, the goodwill of banks and insurers to do the right thing. And I think that's a, a useful starting point, but that's only gonna take us so far. Um, you know, the corporate world has a fair amount of goodwill. I, I'm quite uh, keen on seeing how banks and insurers can contribute to um, sort of public goods as well as um, to shareholder benefits. Um, but at the same time, um, that, relying on goodwill is not gonna get us to where I think we need to be in terms of a, a just transition. So it's, it's where we are now and where we need to be um, for a while still, but at some point we're gonna need to make a transition toward um, the, the, the regulatory angle and getting um, clearer regulations for financial institutions so that, um, so that all financial institutions are, are bearing the, the burden sharing the burden maybe is a better way of saying it um, and that uh, you know so for example right now if you say okay I am, am no longer going to be or I'm going to start reducing my lending activities to um, to coal industry for example well that's that's great but that 
you know, doesn't mean that another bank might not come in behind you and, and start lending to to the the mines, um, the coal mines, and and keeping them operating. So uh, there's definitely concerns about the substitution effect that we need to um, to to address uh, as we move forward. Um, so what are the the levers that um, the financial institutions have? Um, so they can uh, certainly incentivize positive change themselves. Uh, they can um, sort of improve the, their outreach to underserved market segments. Um, they can enhance the readiness to, of society to face climate and transition-induced risks. So there's a number of sort of ways in which financial institutions can engage. Um, and the, the approach that we, we advocate for is really based on a foundation of social dialogue and stakeholder engagement, that um, financial institutions aren't going to be able to do this on their own. Um, they really need to talk to and engage with communities um, in order to be able to achieve the, the positive change that they're, they're hoping to, to accomplish. So how do they do that? Um, you know, the starting point is really thinking about uh, high-level commitment. Um, and I'll give you an example of HSBC where they put out a, a publication last year indicating what their corporate perspective was on uh, inclusive climate transition uh, from an investment perspective, really making a strong case for the business case that they saw for this transition. Um, so it's not out of the goodwill of their, their hearts, but because um, it's the right thing to do and right thing for it planet, but also the right thing for, um, for shareholders as well, um, at least in the long term. This is always one of the tricky parts when we're talking about uh, the business case and climate is the, the length of time that you're willing to see. You know, if you're looking at quarterly results, you're not going to make these investments. But if you're looking at you know, five, 10 years, then you're, you're likely to, to make these investments um, and see the benefits of uh, be able to get the results that you're looking for in the sort of medium term. So high level commitment is really a, a key piece of this, um, starting with the board and then thinking about how to, to operationalize that commitment. Uh, this is an example from BMP Paribas, which um, created an internal network of uh, employees and BMP Paribas is a huge company. So, they, so having a, a 700 person team of sustainable finance experts is, uh, is uh, it's an important commitment. Huh? Um, but then they, through this network, internal network of sustainable finance experts within the bank are able to share their experiences, um, tricks of the trade, successes, also failures. I mean, we, this, is, um, this is new territory uh, that financial institutions are engaging with. And so they're not always gonna have the success that they want to have. Um, so having this internal network of uh, sustainable finance experts, I think it's a really important way um, to operationalize a commitment to, to financing a just transition. Um, and then those, those experts need to have the tools. They need to have the right ways of implementing and what products to offer. So that's really the next element. Um, how do you assess your client's exposure so just transition related risks uh, is an important question to, to ask um, because this isn't about the banks themselves. This is the banks exerting their influence on their customers, right? And so they need to be able to convince their customers that they want to make this transition and to help their customers appreciate the risk that they're exposed to um, uh, by not moving uh, quickly to make this transition. And then the banks need to come up with the right products and solutions that will help facilitate that transition uh, and then actively support um, green activities. Um, so remember back to my original slide with the three columns, it's what are the opportunities in terms of green financing, but also how do we move away from the, the carbon emitting elements? And then the third piece is the, uh, the resilience element, the adaptation piece. Here's a, an interesting example of um, uh, EDF, a French uh, utility company. Um, 
that created a social impact bond. Uh, so they needed to have the money to be able to invest in the infrastructure for green energy. Uh, and part of the proceeds of the, the bond that created the financing of the, the green energy infrastructure was then used to, to pay for um, social projects. Uh, so that was their way of, of articulating this just transition in both elements, moving away from um, carbon emitting uh, energy sources, uh, while at the same time um, thinking about the just element that uh, you know, the, the six beehives at the bottom of that first slide. Another example is uh, insurance for wind power. So you know, by making um, that insurance available, it's a way to make it easier for businesses that are investing in, in, in wind solutions um, to be able to generate uh, energy and take knowing that the risks of um, storm or lightning or floods um, for their for their uh, turbines uh, will be will be protected. So that's a, it's a way of incentivizing or, or providing services that um, uh, help the, the wind energy uh, companies to be able to operationalize. So, how to do this? Um, I guess one of the key pieces it, to recognize is that banks can't and insurers can't really do this on their own. Um, that they need to do it through stakeholder dialogue. They need to engage with the communities. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later on. But the, the idea of, say, the workers in the businesses that um, are moving away from uh, carbon emitting activities, they need to have uh, you know, the, the reskilling that uh, and uh, upskilling job training opportunities and maybe even relocation um, into jobs that, um, or jobs in general, maybe jobs in, in, in green sectors, um, but they need to sort of have employment opportunities as the businesses that they're operating now are, are um, no longer, either no longer operating or, or moving away from the, the types of activities that, uh, that those workers knew how to do before. And that's not something a bank would finance necessarily. Uh, and so it's really important that the, the financial institutions and the businesses, that their, their customers and the governments are working together to really think through this tr um, skill transition uh, that, that are needed for the workers um, who um, we want to make sure are not left behind in this process. Um, so that's uh, you know, the example, a little bit from Barclays, where um, they assess the, the, their clients' needs um, and have the tools to be able to do that uh, and then work with them to be able to um, engage with the, the workforce in making this transition. Uh, and then the example here, the second one, by miles, is an interesting example of um, instead of just car insurance in general, um, providing insurance based on the number of miles that you drive as a way of making insurance cheaper for people who drive less, right? So um, it's a way of reducing um, uh, personal transport uh, through the, the using insurance as an incentive to, uh, to, to do that. Um, I, I mentioned this idea of stakeholder engagement a couple of times now, um, but I just wanna emphasize it because it's, it's really absolutely critical. Um, so I'll give you an example. So PNC Bank, it's a, it's a bank in, in the U.S. in Pittsburgh, and they formed a community advisory council uh, to engage with grassroots organizations to be able to sort of understand the potential impact that they're having on the community. Um, generally, uh, an Italian um, bank has uh, set up uh, uh, their own internal uh, engagement discussions with uh, with workers um, to be able to to understand how workers uh, in the businesses that they're transitioning, particularly coal companies, um, have a voice in in that transition. Uh, and uh, another example from Spain with the EIB group and Bank Santander, um, where they um, 
you know, securitizing a, an SME fund in order to be able to increase access to finance for SMEs. Um, but the, the first two examples, I think, are, are really quite interesting in the sense that, uh, that, that their strategy um, requires this community engagement. And you know, if you think about this right now on a voluntary basis, it makes sense for financial institutions to do that, to really understand how what the potential impacts are and where there's adverse impacts to be able to facilitate um, or encourage uh, amelioration solutions that might be possible um, for those adverse impacts. But if we, when we move toward a more regulatory requirement and saying this is what financial institutions have to do, then I'm worried that this sort of community engagement will end up being more box ticking exercise that uh, yes, we have, we've discussed with the community. Well, how do you know you discuss with the right people in the community? How, do you, how, how have you listened to what they said and put that into practice? So this is, I think, one of the, certainly a gray area, an area that um, is going to require much more um, yeah, examples of how to do it and, and clearer guidance on um, how to, yeah, how to, who to engage with, how to engage with them, and then how to take their suggestions and recommendations into, into consideration. Um, and then lastly, we need, you know, we're not going to make any progress. We're not um, setting targets and then measuring our progress to achieve those targets. And here, I think in general, the, the environmental side of the ESG uh, agenda has gotten a lot better on how we're measuring um, our contributions to, to the greening aspect. But the S part, the social part in the ESG agenda is, um, is it's much more process related, like this community engagement, and much harder to um, quantify. Uh, and so I think that's one of the areas that moving forward, we need to have better measurements of um, what it takes to, to create a just transition and, and measurements of whether we're achieving that or not. Uh, so that's what I wanted to, to briefly introduce to you today to, to help explain what we mean by just transition and the role of banks and insurers in, in contributing to that. They're not gonna achieve it on their own. Uh, and it's exciting to see the, the companies that are willing to get out front and be first movers and achieve uh, a very positive um, impact. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how long it takes for this sort of voluntary approach to transition into a, a, a regulated approach. Uh, Maybe a while still, um, because uh, because a lot of what we're talking about is more process related, and that's I think much harder to to regulate than um, some of the more quantifiable pieces of, of the puzzle. Uh, so with that, thank you all for your attention, and happy to take any. Any questions or engage in discussion uh, as uh, as you'd like to proceed? Thank you, Mr. Churchill. Thank you, Mr. Churchill. Now we'd like to invite the moderator back to the stage. So allow me to welcome onto the stage. Mr. Tim Guo. And now I'd like to hand over the microphone to a Deputy Minister of Environment, Ms. Shi. Thank you very much, Mr. For the audience's convenience, I think I'll switch to uh, Mandarin now, but uh, you can hear from your earphone the, uh, uh, inst uh, the, the translation uh, will be provided. Uh, how, now we'll So thank you, Mr. Craig uh, Churchill, for your wonderful sharing. I believe many of our uh, audience members today are in the finance, uh, financial industry. So from his presentation, you could see that the concept of just transition seems uh, quite new, but it is essential to incorporate this idea into our decision-making, and it's important to, to have the process ready. 
uh, he also shared a lot of case studies where banks around the world uh, are already incorporating this idea. A lot of Taiwanese companies are also doing well uh, embodying what's called just transition. And today, uh, we are honored to have two uh, panelists. The first one is Mr. Tim Guo, president from Taipei Fubang Commercial Bank, uh, which is a, a leader, a pioneer in the banking sector who first initiated the uh, sustainability bond in Taipei. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, President Guo, to share uh, his idea on just transition. What are uh, another, our second uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Jerry Lin, Chief of the Center for Sustainable Finance Development from Taiwan Academy of Banking and Finance. It's an institution that is dedicated to uh, talent training in the financial sector. And uh, for today, he would talk about also, how uh, a green finance and just transition. So I'll stop here. Uh, President Guo, please. Uh, thank you, moderator. It is a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Taipei Fubon Commercial Bank to share our approaches to a sustainable transition. Uh, as a member in the financial industry, we know uh, we have a role to play in a sustainable transition. The capital and proceeds we have uh, can play a role, can be a good leverage for businesses uh, to make an impact. So uh, let me start with uh, our financial holding entity. So uh, through a top-down perspective, there are four strategies. On the left, you see decarbonization. We want to help our clients to uh, achieve decarbonization and uh, sustainable transition. So on the tool side, uh, we provide all sorts of uh, financial services and instruments to help them uh, realize this target. The second pillar is digitalization. Uh, internally, uh, we want to encourage a uh, positive, inclusive workplace through the third element, empowerment. Uh, externally, we want to uh, play a positive role in the community, in society, through education and connection. So these are four uh, strategies we use to reach our sustainability vision. So uh, below you see our targets. Last year, uh, in 2023, the balance of green investment and financing reached uh, around 600 billion and dollars. And then this year, our target is around 60, uh, 650 billion and dollars. Uh, I will talk more about that later. So the Taiwanese government uh, has pledged to reach net zero by 2050 and formulated 12 key strategies. One of them is green finance. So uh, that's where we, we can uh, make a contribution. So, and that's why we're dedicated to uh, green finance through proactive engagement with clients, through identifying their actual needs, and uh, enforcing our ESG reviews to evaluate the impact on environment and society. 
uh, another approach uh, that we have taken is to lead small companies through bigger companies. Uh, bigger companies have relatively more resources to promote ESG, so we work with the bigger ones to um, lead industry-level transition. And big companies could also leverage their supply chain power to drive a uh, green transition. Uh, for SMEs, we also have organized many ESG forums to help them build uh, carbon reduction capabilities. Uh, on the organization side, uh, there are two ways. One is top-down. So all our senior executives, from chairman to uh, department chiefs, uh, are required to allocate at least 5 to 10 percent of their goal setting to ESG targets, depending on uh, their job title. So below the board of directors, we have a sustainable development task force chaired or headed by the president. Um, the task force is in charge of uh, holding a meeting every quarter. And um, the independent directors will join the meeting as consultants. And for every half, half year, they will consolidate the, the data and report to the audit committee. So uh, we have many corporate uh, clients who are able to promote green transition. So uh, within our organization, corporate banking and uh, risk management are the two main teams uh, for this topic. And we have a whole process planned, for example, um, evaluating the risk of the client beforehand, and then we know how to promote the idea of ESG to client. We, we would tell them if you want the best support, what kind of ESG metrics uh, should be uh, reached. That is how we communicate uh, our emphasis on ESG. We would also advise them on, uh, in internally, we also focus on talent training. So for example, uh, yearly or annual training, on ESG, we also have this Think ESG uh, interdepartment platform to increase uh, internal awareness on ESG topics. So um, banks would provide credit to their clients, and you need to review your clients. Uh, in the past, many of the banks would use the 5P principles. But that's very fundamental now. Now with these, you also have to do AML, anti money laundering um, checks and ESG checks. So after ESG checks, we would uh, identify the suitable strategy for a client engagement. So if their capital is used for low carbon trend, transformation, green energy development, uh, things that are conducive to environmental protection, we would proactively undertake their cases. If the client um, is of a high impact industry, but they are dedicated to transition, we would provide uh, resources to encourage transition. There are also clients who are of high impact sectors, but with no uh, measures to foster transition, then we would gradually phase out these clients. And the last one is uh, clients in the high impact industry with no intent to reduce their impact, then we would decline cooperation with them. So on the loan uh, side, it's also like a funnel a process we put into place. So uh, on the first step, you see a, a checklist, ESG checklist, that identifies negative list industries, ESG high risk factors, high carbon emission sensitive industries, and uh, the equator principles. So we filter the clients 
Uh, so clients also need to fill out surveys, provide some uh, information. We would also uh, do background checks through open data. We would also review uh, the clients, for example, water usage, energy usage in the past few years. Are they uh, improving their energy efficiency, etc.? So this is how we do an ESG uh, review, and then we put, put them into different categories. For example, high environment impact, medium, low, and then there are ESG resources, so it's like a matrix. So the higher score they get, the more willing we are to engage with them. So this uh, mechanism and uh, review helps us communicate with clients and help us communicate our uh, focus on ESG targets. So this is on uh, the investment business. Uh, similar negative uh, list industries. And here we have a lot of uh, big companies for clients, so it's important, so it's easy for us to get open data on these companies to uh, conduct a review and check. So after they get yes on each of the step, then we would uh, put them on our client list. So this slide talks about uh, our uh, engagement with uh, the authority and businesses. So for authority, uh, we are on the ba new Basel Agreement Pressure Test Group Task Force. We also uh, work with the government in, for example, um, carbon emissions scope three projects, uh, net zero task force or project, etc. For uh, corporate client size, we communicate uh, how we value ESG, for especially for SMEs. As I mentioned, we organize a lot of uh, ESG forums, seminars, and for a forum like this, uh, in the past two years, we've held many, many forums with more than 1,600 participants and over 300 uh, corporate clients joining us. So uh, what are some of the achievements we've managed to, to get? So since 2018 to date, uh, we've financed over 5.9 gigawatts of renewable energy projects. And in 2022 and 2023, uh, for two years in a row, we've been the market leader in green uh, project financing uh, as an, an arranger. So every year we support uh, these companies in generating over 15.6 billion kilowatt hours, uh, reducing 7.8 million tons of carbon. So here you see two pillars, uh, wind and solar. So for wind, starting from 2018, we've participated in seven uh, offshore wind projects um, we provided financing, um, the most financing. And then in solar, we also uh, participated in many uh, seven major solar projects. So here you see a more case studies. Uh, on, the, on the right side, we uh, launched the first uh, sustainability index linked loans. And then also, uh, we also uh, participated in the first third-party verified green uh, syndicated loan project. Uh, below you see uh, we arranged a three-year 90 million syndicated loan for a Chinese international uh, Vietnam. We also helped the Indian National Bank um, to launch the first social responsibility syndicated loan. It's one of the largest within the country. 
And also, we've been working with the Taipei City government because we have a goal that by 2030, um, Taipei City would like to see all the buses become electrical. So um, we are supporting the bus companies to do the transition. So we are working with the Ministry of Eco uh, Economic Affairs and also other authorities to support um, low interest loans. Uh, we've been we have supported more than a hundred small and medium sized companies. So um, that's how we dedicate the low interest rate um, decarbonization loans to our small com uh, small medium sized companies. So in the past few years, as we've been dedicated in renewable energy, um, we brought this to Afro Asia. We brought our story there in the forum. Um, IFA, that was um, that is actually uh, one of the most prestigious trade magazine, and we were very honored to be nominated. And actually, we um, won the recognition um, to be a sustainable um, supply linked um, loan lenders. So, um, speaking of the scale. Um, what does it mean to have a six hundred billion loan? So actually, offering loan to companies, we look at external investment. So now we have six hundred billion, and more than thirty percent of the loans actually are linked to green loan. It's like when we are lending a hundred dollars, then thirty out of one hundred is related to green loan. It could be. Um, financing or loans. So we would like to increase the rate, actually. So here you can see from 2002 to, to uh, 2024, we have won various awards in green loan and also um, green transformation. So due to time constraint, maybe I should stop here. Um, these are the efforts we have committed as a bank as a role um, in the financial institutions. So thank you, Mr. Guo. Um, later in the QA session, I believe there will be many questions and that um, people will be interested in knowing more about your strategies in Taipei Fubang Bank. Hi, um, Minister Xu and Mr. Guo. Uh, Mr. Churchill, um, I'm honored to be pre uh, to present my ideas to you. Um, first of all, just transition. I think the scale of it has exceeded low carbon emission transition. So today, as our topic is green financing, just transition. I think this is really a very important topic that all the financial um, industry stakeholders should pay attention to. So we have this um, big goal of 2050 net zero trans transition. So we have separate goals, sub goals, the energy transition, industry transition, lifestyle transition, and social transition. So with the Financial Council, um, we have a guideline, a guidance for energy supplying uh, industries and also um, facility companies to um, comply with the guideline. As to social transition and lifestyle transition, we are laying out projects to fulfill the needs of the community because in recent years, as we proceed and see progress of green transition, certainly there are some communities or groups that would have heavier negative impacts than others. So we have to support them with more just and also more inclusive measures. However, in recent years, the topics for just transition have changed. In the past, um, people talked about labor, employment, community, but now we look at the natural environment, land use, and 
infrastructure build up and how we distribute social resources and also consumer rights. That is the scope of the target has expanded, and in Taiwan. As we have laid out a strategic path for just transition, and we have this climate change act, and we have specifically set the targets for net zero progress. So you can say um, net zero transition and just transition. Now they are on the same track. Speaking of just transition. From the perspective of industries, community, and consumers, I mean they have different goals. In industry, we leverage green smart technology, and we support traditional brick and mortar shops or lower and um, or traditional industries to upgrade themselves so that they can have new competitiveness. And we can deliver structural transition. And in the industry, in the sub, if we look at the geographic、um, distribution, in different areas,、um, people are confronted with different impacts. So we have subsidies, we have、um, different supporting programs to deliver our ecological transition. And for labor, we need to make sure. As we are fighting against climate change, as the industry are evolving, becoming a green industry, we make sure the labor rights are protected, and they are upskilled, and they have more job opportunity in the process of transition. And in the consumer side, we are guiding the society to pay more attention to sustainable consumption and also low carbon green lifestyle. We guarantee the low carbon consumption, so that we can raise proper awareness of low carbon consumption. We have set out different programs to deliver to deliver these goals, and these programs need budget and also capital from the company. Therefore, we have this blended finance model. To drive just transition finance, we leverage the catalytic capital to work with the professional、um, venture or professional capital to make more investments to create more opportunity, supporting the weakened group and. In And deliver industrial transition. And actually, last year,、um, there are various financial tools that we have discussed in other seminars last year. For example, we have private equity, we have venture capital, and also we have family business,、um, and also we have co-financing. We have various forms to build these tools. And actually, if you look at the global arena. Um, we have,、um, for example,、um, we can use the spread or the、um, interest from the co-financing, and we have parallel loans, etc. And also, a very popular topic、um, is the transition bond. These are all the tools we can use, and also for the insurance company,、um, the insurer's capital, also their guarantee, their collateral capital. And also advanced market commitments, etc. And also we have、um, investment in technology, technological collaboration, etc. So how do we blend、um, the private and the public sectors? And then how can we attract more private equity to inject more capital in the private side? So that we can have more、um, support from the society、um, to work with the government to lay out basic、uh, better foundation fighting against climate change. So for a bank, how do we、um, introduce this idea of just 
just transition finance in its operation strategy. Um, in Mr. Churchill's presentation, I think um, it was very clear. So as we look into the United Nations and also ILO guidelines, um, they have a lot of papers, documents uh, relating to uh, relating to this topic. So first of all, we look at the foundations. First of all, the banks should um, look into a holistic um, impact assessment and then set up an internal um, action plan. And the board of directors can implement control and take immediate actions. And for governance, aside from um, having the board of directors taking responsibility, um, there should be other plans in fostering talent, experts, and also set up a de department or a unit for just transition. So we need an internal team. And certainly, um, banks look into the risks um, of this transition. So um, by introducing this idea, the just transition into its um, product development, actually, um, Banks can work with their clients. They can look into different aspects, for example, society, um, labor rights, community development, etc., to develop a localized and consumer-oriented just transition of financial products. And in the loan contract, um, for example, for linked loans, um, the company can include, for example, how are they going to um, train or offer um, capacity building for their laborers um, if they have other measures for the just transition. So when the bank is considering uh, lending money to a certain company, then all these elements um, can be um, covered and should be covered in their contract. So later, when they build up this loan or they are managing the loan or maybe post-loan, they're offering the services and management. These are different dimensions that a bank can implement just transition ideas better. And for due diligence, um, banks can build up their data banks, but database um, they can follow and track the performance of a client in implementing just transition. And inside a bank, if there's a unit to monitor the risks um, that will accelerate the transition, and this can be included in their ESG report. And speaking of talent building, Um, the employees, not only employees actually, but also a lot of personnel, um, different um, departments in the company may need different skill in the process of delivering just transition finance. And we look at the environment um, guidelines and just transition finance guidelines. Um, we have a lot of um, reference materials in United Nations and also um, other global, other international institutions. And for engagement, we can speak to stakeholders, shareholders, the disadvantaged group, and also the um, upper and lower side um, of the supply chain. And the feedbacks from the stakeholders can be covered in the just transition linked financial products or services or um, risk managing bond. And for climate change and low carbon emission, when these become um, factors for certain companies, and if they have loans, then the bank can design in dynamic engagement mechanism so um, the bank can monitor and adjust different conditions when the clients are in different um, context. So last year, uh, FSC was tasked to promote the sustainable finance evaluation. 
and it, it's a big topic within the industry. And last year, they uh, announced the next batch of sustainable finance evaluation metrics. So here you see uh, a lot of elements of stress transition are incorporated. For example, there is uh, an increasing focus on transparency, on the internal control systems, uh, and climate adaptation capabilities, and whether these are incorporated into uh, their decision-making process. Uh, COP28 uh, targets are also uh, incorporated. If we look deeper into the matrix um, from several sides, first client, so here you see uh, the banking industry, or financial industry, need to adopt measures to encourage just transition. So for example, they need to provide uh, funds or services to promote environmental protection. They also need to uh, reference FSC's guidelines to engage their uh, clients in the financing and investment sector. So on the banking industry or the, fin uh, the insurers themselves, they need to evaluate material uh, issues related to their stakeholders. They need to incorporate, uh, for example, sustainability-related uh, issues into their internal control, legal compliance, and risk management approaches. They also need to uh, design matrix for uh, specifically for supporting vulnerable groups. They also need to link their internal promotion evaluations, compensation structures to uh, ESG targets. So uh, through these, they also they also need to make uh, talent cultivation plans to train their employees, senior executives, um, to improve their capabilities on the topic of just transition. Uh, the banking industry, the financial industry also need to allocate profits or budgets uh, for employee transition plans and set key KPIs uh, for lending to SMEs so as to incorporate a just transition to their corporate culture. So uh, in the end, I think while promoting a just transition, it's key to ensure that the speed of uh, adopting low carbon transition, climate change responses, uh, and relevant actions is not affected. Uh, we need to adopt uh, a top-down approach to incorporate the just transition elements into the corporate culture and build a new ecosystem towards more just transition goals and sustainable social value. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Lin. Both of uh, our panelists gave brilliant uh, presentation and had so much to share. I think, yeah, it, it, I'm the same. If I'm a speaker, I would like to talk a lot. So it's better if I'm just a moderator. So we have around 15 minutes left. Uh, Mr. Churcho is still with us online, uh, open for questions. Uh, feel free to ask your questions in Chinese or English. If you have so now we will open the floor. So uh, before you ask your question, please state your name and organization. Uh, I'm an anthropology PhD student, Wang Nai Wen. Two questions. So our topic today is just transition. It involves a lot of social issues, actually. So uh, for the financial industry, it's quite tricky to quantify these social issues. I came from a social study background, and I'm very interested. Um, I pay a, a lot of attention to how this works. And uh, another issue is on the word uh, just. Uh, 
we see a lot of injustice, injustices uh, before transition takes place. But uh, I think we don't hear people talk enough about these injustices, these forms of injustices. It seems we can make this transition and we have justice and we don't care about all those injustices before the transition. Um, uh, Mr. Churchill shared many case studies on, uh, especially about uh, re renewables, renewable energies. But there are 17 SDGs, and uh, a lot of companies are using SROIs, other metrics to evaluate their performance. But again, the the element of time chronology is not considered. And I think that's what we should address firsthand. So who do you want to direct your question to? I think it's a rare opportunity to have, have all the experts. And two of them are in the financial industry. I'd like to ask the two panelists if for their view. I think we would take two or mo three more questions, maybe focus more on the uh, how the financial industry promotes just transition. Yes, please. Uh, my question is for Mr. Churchill. I'll ask in English. Taiwan是气候行动网络研究中心的杨佩伟。I'm Yang Peiwei from the Climate Action Alliance. Climate Action Network Research Unit. Two very quick questions for Mr. Churchill. Um, thinking, first one is thinking about operationalizing the guidelines that you have laid out in the ILO report. Um, in a case like the uh, United Auto Workers strikes in the United States last year, where we saw um, union activists starting to advocate along the lines of just transition um, and against the more conventional red green sort of um, uh, red, uh, grievances, uh, let's put it that way. Um, in your view, what are the what's the role that finance institu financial institutions and banks can play in advancing? Um, that kind of red-green alliance and bridging the gap between um, conventional sort of union concerns and the needs to say um, advance the EV transition, um, since that's the role of banks in that kind of scenario seems to be lacking in the general conversation thus far. Um, the second question is, um, given how broad just transition itself is, I think a lot of um, well, the simple way to put this question is how do we qualify, what do we qualify as just transition finance and um, what, kind of, what kinds of activities should be um, counted towards just transition finance against the sort of risk of um, anything falling under that big umbrella and then taking the advantage of um, this sort of policy opportunity. Um, would something in your view, like um, the Justice 40 initiative in the United States, where there are very clear sort of uh, communities that would benefit from these uh, investments um, with very clear sort of investment, uh, types of investments, would that on a government level be something that you think would be ideal to counter that risk um, or um, what are your views on sort of making sure that just transition finance and the money that flows into these activities are actually um, actually aligned with ILO defined just transition principles? Thank you. We would uh, collect the third question and then have them answered. Because today we also uh, have two uh, experts, uh, two pioneers in the green finance sector. So uh, 
if you have any questions regarding、uh, actual practices in driving, just transition, green finance, it would be a great opportunity to ask your question and pick their brains. Yes, please. For Craig Churchill and also for the Gu Gu Zhong, <laughs> yeah. But I will speak English first because it's more relate to the because I'm from Fu Bang Life, and the, like、uh, Craig mentioned, like EDF, they issue a green bond, which EDF is currently, you know, one of our investment. And we know EDF is a utility company, which they、like, kind of have some coal emission as well. However, they try to transfer to a nuclear generation, which is good. And then they issue a green bond, which is quite positive. And our question is for the engagement part, because we had large、uh, investment position in the US and the European bond. However, as a bond investor, it's It's not easy for us to engage, you know, with them since we are in direct investment. Not like bank, they have direct investing. So we just want to seek your advice. How can a Taiwanese insurer company, you know, in, get more involved in those engagement, either through email or phone or you know any kind of or maybe third party like CA one hundred. Like what will you? What will be your advice? 那请教郭总也是类似的问题，因为 similar question to uh President Guo because uh banks are already doing a great job, and we want to incorporate that into、uh, our investment process. But for example, Exxon Mobil, Shell, these big oil, uh, we we want to be a part of their net zero. Transition, but for them, we are just、uh, a small investor, right? With limited influence and and with indirect influence. But like uh, uh, bigger insurers or other insurers, they have a bigger sway or influence. So for overseas. Cases like, for example, your investment in、uh, Chinese International Vietnam.、Uh, of course, you have a bigger engagement power. But for us, indirect investors,、uh, what are some resources you can share uh, as uh, I- I- from the banking sector? Big questions that are addressed to Craig Churchill.、Uh, Craig, would you、um, please take the floor first? Thank you. Excellent.、Um, can you hear me? Yes,、so、we can. Yes, we、uh, can. <laughs> sure.、Um, really, really、uh, intelligent questions,、um, and I'll I'll take a stab at trying to answer them. I think、um, they're not easy ones to answer.、Um, one on this idea of、uh, you know, role of banks in facilitating red green alliance. I'm not sure that. Financial institutions necessarily want to sort of get into the political side of things.、Um, I think you know they want to have their processes of screening、uh, their investees, their clients, and and、uh, you know, guiding them toward、uh, the transition and making sure that that transition is just.、Um, but.、Uh, I don't think that they necessarily want to get into the political conversations themselves. That the, I guess maybe the exception to that might be really advocating for、um, government programs that、um, that really facilitate the transition being just.、Um, and here, the the easiest ones to to sort of envision are sort of reskilling,、um, uh, unemployment insurance. You know, if if Uh, workers lose their jobs, making sure that they have、uh, livelihood opportunities and so forth. So, I think that's the piece that、um, you know, banks can't really facilitate this transition effectively if there aren't alternatives for、uh, the workers and the businesses that are are, are losing out.、Um, so that's, I guess, one way of looking at it. I I totally agree that this concept of justice is incredibly broad.、Um, I. Was on a panel recently, and、uh, 
basically anything that sounded nice that another panelist was sort of throwing in there saying, well, this is just, this is just, like all these things sound nice, but um, but how do we measure that? And I think that is a, a recurring theme that many of the questions were asking. Um, and, and this was quite uh, obvious in the, the first presentation by the, the president of the, the Taipei Fubon Bank, um, where he was putting some very impressive results in terms of uh, green energy produced and uh, carbon reductions. Um, uh, and those are the things that are easy to measure. And those are certainly, obviously, the most important pieces right now in terms of the, the, uh, the, enter the environmental emergencies that we need to address. But there wasn't any way for him to articulate the S part. He kept saying the ESG, uh, checklist and assessment that they had, uh, but all of the information that was provided was on the E part. And so that we really need to have a better way of articulating the S part. Um, and, you know, maybe something along the lines of, you know, decent jobs created and lost and, and sort of measuring those. Um, and then what is decent and certainly decent means that there is, you know, living wages and that there is, um, uh, social dialogue in the businesses that, that they're operating and so forth. So there's, there's different ways of sort of uh, uh, articulating what is decent and, and, and measuring the decent jobs that are created and lost. And that may be a movement toward um, having a measurement on the S part, but, um, but there's so many other dimensions to the S that, uh, or that you mentioned. So um, there's some uh, organizations sort of focus in on this inclusion piece and focus in on the um, the exclusion piece, trying to you know, make sure that uh, exclu excluded populations are included in the, in, the, in the transition and so forth. And then the question on the bond investments, um, you know, this, this is, it's related to the measurement uh, factor as well, that the only way for you to know is if there's a way to measure whether those bonds are um, not just so great that they're contributing to the green outcomes and please do <laughs> more the merrier, uh, but we need to have a way for uh, bond rating agencies to, to validate whether that transition is also just, and that doesn't exist yet. So that hopefully that fits into the agenda for rating agencies. Um, and in what time period? Yeah, that's, the, that's the, I think that's the, the million dollar question, billion dollar question, whatever, because um, it is so urgent uh, that this happened. Um, that we can't really wait around for figuring these things out. So hopefully the sense of urgency will spill over from the, the E part of the ESG into the S part soon. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you very much, uh, Craig, for your uh, great answer as well. Uh, so for President Guo, um, yes, there was a question for you. And also the first, yeah, I will try to answer these questions. Yes, President Guo. Yes, the anthropology PhD student, you did mention um, several questions. Um, the first question is about quantification, how to quantify um, the narration or the process. Yes, for the bank, it's the same. It's very often a challenge that we have to face. Like I mentioned, we had a lot of green due diligence. We have our own methodology, and different banks have different methodologies. Like people have different um, pair of glasses, you can say this. And for example, the Green DD say um, company A, um, he received 80 points in our bank, um, but in other bank he could only, maybe the company only get 50 points. So different company, uh, different banks have different methodology and we are trying to align, we are still accumulating our experiences. So for the authority concerned, for the government, um, I think there are, yes, there are lots of external references we can look at. For example, the TEJ, um, there's a local media, they, it's like a rating, um, for these different companies. Um, the media, they will look at this, so, so to speak, the key or the big companies. So the banks can refer to this list. So for companies, once they disclose how they, um, lower their carbon emission, and if um, the government or maybe a f just a third party, someone raise up, uh, rise up to 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 uh, to be at this position to ask for um, companies to disclose their carbon emission um, information, etc. I think that would be really helpful for banks doing due diligence. 
And other questions. I mean, all these are good questions. Yes, and for green energy, we are not just looking at the big names, say、um, wind energy or、um, green energy. We also look at companies. If,、um, for example, they are buying these facilities to lower carbon emission, how are they? They told us, okay, they are improving ESG, and they are complying for linked loans, and it could be linked to external.、Um, Indicators or external, in, whether external or internal. So,、um, actually, there are different indicators. So, for us,、um, if the company or the、um, applicant can pass more than three indicators, then I mean, let's pass. We not we we are not just looking at the、um, wind energy or green energy. So, each year also the bank we will make adjustment to our、um, lending policy. And for just transition, I think、um, Professor Lin、um, he will know better. Also, I can answer to the other question.、Um, there was、um, a lady.、Um, she's from、um, Fu.、Uh, you are from Fu Bang Insurance. Well, insurance and banking these are actually close but not. Very、um, similar <laughs> position. I mean, for bank because we are facing a client, we are lending them money, so we can deliver bigger impact to the client. And for you,、uh, when you are making investments, you are the buy side. And for sell side, I mean, a lot of an、uh, analysts and、um, a lot of people will、um, come to you and asking for money. So for you, maybe you can consider having.、Um, you can change your waiting method.、Um, you can. Place、um, more attention to、um, just transition, and certainly、um, you are looking at、um, the bond and and stock. But、uh, from my understanding, the cafe、um, insurance that、um, our competitor in Taiwan actually they will have direct investment in win win. Energy company, they are not making investment via the bonds or stocks. So、um, that I think that's how you can expand your、um, impact. And、um, Professor Lin,、uh, speaking of measurement, yes, that's a big question. Nowadays, a lot of、um, financial institutions, when they are disclosing the information, certainly、um, we focus on、um, climate change, um, carbon emission. However, at this moment. Um, the accuracy, the precision, the quality of this data. I think there's still a big question mark. And if you look at the social expenditure, how do we disclose the amount, the scale of、um, social expenditure? That's really、um, ambiguous information. And around the world,、um, there are different groups that will be impacted in. This green transition, and there are different group of people. It could be、um, a disadvantaged group, and I think、um, it's really difficult to measure all this. And however, in、um, ESG, I think in the future they will have a stricter、um, demand for social、uh, social impact. So I would say maybe you can build a database, and through different methodology of DD. We can have disclose. We can disclose more、um, sustainability related information. However, I want to highlight that、um, the indicators.、Um, if we are to set up indicators, I think it's also related to. I mean, how big、uh, the scale of this financial group? Yeah, because time is up. My apologies, as the moderator. This is my right, and I have to control the time. Uh, uh, receiving Taipei,、uh, thank you so much for the uh, very insightful uh, keynote speech as well as the uh, uh, answers at the Q A session. 那我们也谢谢这个两位语坛人 And also thank you, our dear panelists, President Guo, and also Professor Lin. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much.